Thank you. Uh, One day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him and he asked them, who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. Then he asked them, but who do you, who, who do you say I am? Peter replied, you're the Messiah sent from God. Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. The son of man must suffer many terrible things, he said. He'll be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He'll be killed, but on the third day, he'll be raised from the dead. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up on your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God. Can I get the lights? Oh, thank you. Great job, worship team. Man, you guys sound amazing week to week. Sounds real good, right? Yeah? No? Am I the only one that thinks that? It sounds, it sounds great, right? It sounds amazing. You guys are, yeah, awesome. Very gifted crew here. We're continuing our series in Luke. Uh, we are just, just so you know, there's many chapters of Luke. We're, we're not going through verse by verse, but we are going at least one passage per chapter there are many, many chapters. So um, we're going to be in the gospel of Luke for a while. And that is a really good thing that we take so seriously reading and studying God's word that we're not afraid to camp out in it. We're not afraid to take our time with it. Um, but we really want to investigate it. We really want to invest in it and allow it to invest in ourselves. And so that's, again, one of the primary reasons if you're sitting here like Luke again, yeah, praise be to God again, again. <laughs> okay, so um, there's a really important series of questions that I want to dive into and really spend most of today focusing on. But in order to understand, I guess, the nature of these questions, I need to tell you about a certain acronym that will inevitably be uh, relevant for all of you. This acronym is DTR. How many of you know what a DTR is, a DTR conversation? How many of you ever heard of that, a DTR conversation? Anyone? Maybe some of you older folks, a DTR, George, my man, Ethan, great job. Anyone want to guess what is a DTR conversation in a relationship? Okay, a DTR conversation which every single one of you have, will eventually have, is called, it stands for a, a define the relationship conversation. So uh, you know, whether it's my, you know, me and Jillian, when we're dating at a certain point, you, you will date someone or you will hang out with someone. And then they, you get to this nebulous season where you're like, what, what are we? What, what exactly are we? And then you kind of have to have this weird moment where you sit down and you actually have to put some some parameters around that. And if you don't, that leads to some of the most unhealthiest kind of relationship dynamics when you're just both in the nebulous and the middle and the gray, and it creates a lot of opportunity for hurt and hardship. So a DTR, a define the relationship conversation, really acts as that moment that clarifies what you and this other person are. Are you guys just friends? Are you guys best friends? Are you guys boyfriend or girlfriend? In many ways, the questions that Jesus is asking here, it's kind of a DTR conversation that he's having with his closest disciples. And the reason why this is so important to have is because based on my understanding and experience, and I'm sure you would agree with this, your generation seems to have sort of like, um, like an allergy to clarity of relationship. In fact, 
I've noticed that in your generation, more than my generation or any generation before my generation, your generation actually expects a bit of gray. And to add more parameters in the gray actually is kind of a taboo, maybe even offensive at times. And so every time I'm talking to young people about their dating lives, there's an expectation of there's gray. Oh, Pastor Philip, you old. That's not how we do things anymore. We keep things in the gray. Why you got to define things? I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I don't know any healthy relationship that operates like that. I'm pretty sure your mom and dad don't live in the gray. <laughs> Are we married today? You want to be married? No, no, not feeling it. Maybe tomorrow. That's not how marriages work. That's not how good families work. Are you my dad today? Maybe I don't No, 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 no. There are parameters and there's clarity to it. In fact, not just like romantic relationships, but aren't the greatest of friendships clear? Dude, we grew up together. Okay, this is going to be such a stupid thing, but I'm just going to share this privately with you guys. This doesn't leave this room. Back in my day, when there were like your friends and your best friends, and then in my like sort of tightest circle of people that I hung out with, we used to have this thing called homeboy, right? Like so-and-so, that's my friend. Yeah, but that's my homeboy. That means if you could be dying, you could be in the middle of nowhere at 4 a.m., you, you're not going to call your parents. You're going to call your homeboy. That's See, there, there's, there's beauty and clarity. You know, you, 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 if you know that this person is your, whatever your equivalent to homeboy is, you know you can go to that person, even when things are tough or costly. And so Jesus, in the same way, he's trying to have a DTR with his homeboys, with, with, his, with his disciples. And he asked two questions. Number one, he asked the question, who do people say I am? And the second thing he asked is, who do you say I am? When I first read this text when I was younger, I thought that Jesus was saying like, hey, what's like, what is general everybody's opinion of me? Okay, yeah, but you, you can't be like everyone else. Don't sell out. I thought that was pretty the simplicity of the message. And some of you who've heard this text before, maybe that's what you automatically assume. But actually, these two questions are with intention. They carry the same amount of intention. As in, as much as Jesus wants you to think about who he is to yourself, he's also asking the question, do you understand? Have you spent time actually understanding what people are saying and thinking about me? Because if you don't understand that, how do you know what you think about me is what is no different than what they think about me? You understand? So in many ways, at some point in your life, you have to answer these questions. You have to answer, what, what do they, whoever they are, say about Jesus? And who do you, what do you say about Jesus? And who is Jesus to you? And again, these are not simple questions. These are very, very difficult. I just need to nerd out some of, some of you just older folk here, okay? I, I just need to share a couple of thoughts with you. This is a, this guy's, I would call him a cultural commentator named Mark Series, Christian intellect, Christian scholar. I thought he summed up how difficult it is to answer the question, who do they say I am? Pretty well. This is what Sayer says in this book. The average person in the West carries around in their head a set of assumptions that are culturally imbibed. Assumptions such as the idea that spirituality is preferable to organized religion. How I many you guys feel that? I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. That love is a feeling, not a discipline. That if something is mundane, it must be boring and bad. That individual freedom trumps the collective. That travel broadens the mind or that we can do what we like as long as it does not hurt anybody. That travel broadens the mind. Oh, my goodness. In the church, how many times do we send kids on missionary trips that aren't ready? They're not even Christians. And we tell them to go be missionary. Yeah. He goes, he continues, Rabbi Shmuley Botik, Botek, I guess, commenting on the religiosity of contemporary culture, notes that in the West, we now have a generation whose principal desire is to feel God rather than to worship him. So when it comes to, if Jesus sat down with you and says, hey, who do people say I am? You could be like, oh, well, people think you're just like lame or whatever. Actually, Mark Sayer just saying, no, no, no. You have to actually think about that question. It's very hard to answer that question. Unless you go out and are having actual conversations with people, you'll never be able to answer this question. And not only people out like outside of the church, but even inside the church. Let me just share one more quote with you, okay? This is a, a similar guy who's a Christian intellect. He says about people within the church, he says, we have created 
Youth ministry, for instance, that confuses extroversion with faithfulness. We have effectively commuted. You don't understand that first sentence? Confuses extroversion with faithfulness. My goodness, that is so true in youth ministries, especially. That if you're this bombastic, boisterous person, suddenly you're faithful. That's a good youth leader. They could preach heresy on Sundays, but as long as they got fun games, it's good. That's crazy. That is craziness, right? We have effectively communicated to young people that sincerely, sincerely following Jesus is synonymous with being fired up for Jesus, having like lots of emotions for Jesus, with being excited for Jesus, as if discipleship were synonymous with fostering an exuberant, perky, cheerful, hooray for Jesus disposition like that we might find in the Glee Club or at a pep rally. I don't know, man. To me, that hit hard. That, that makes so much sense to me when I think about youth groups that I've seen, or even some of the expectations some of your parents have for this group here. It's hard to answer the question, who do people say I am? Because even in the church, I don't know if people really know who Jesus is, let alone people outside the church. And then when we go on to the next question, but who do you say I am? Likewise, it's just as difficult. I'm not going to read this one because he's a little, I'm realizing a little too intellectual, but let's like Tim Keller, who I quote him all the time. He says this, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. Literally, if he literally rose from the dead, everything he said is true, right? If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything that he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. And so for even you, when you try to answer the question, who is Jesus to me? There's a difference between do I believe that Jesus is still true, though I don't like what he says? Or are you sort of just assuming he doesn't exist because you don't like some of his teachings? You see that? It's complicated. It's a little complex, isn't it? So these are very profound questions Jesus is wanting you to ask and answer because he really wants to define the relationship with you. And he really wants to make clear the nature of Christianity to you. So even though these are difficult, we're going to try to answer these three questions by looking at three points. And, and let me just also say, he kind of emphasizes and stresses the importance and the difficulty of these questions during this text. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But let me just say that I think the best way to un answer these questions is to look at Jesus and three different pronouns. First, Jesus and them. Number two, Jesus and us. And number three, Jesus and me, okay? So number one, Jesus and them. He goes to the, he, he is with, prior to 18 up here, if you go up in your Bible, Jesus is like teaching and he's doing public ministry. And then 18 says, one day Jesus left the crowds and he's now in the privacy of prayer mode with only his disciples. So this is a very intimate setting. Only his disciples are with him, and he asked them very personally as he's looking at just, there's only 12 of them, so he's looking at very carefully each one, and he's saying, who do people say I am? And the word people he uses there is the word chorus, where we get the word chorus. It's the word for um, a community outside of your community, right? We would maybe call them you know, pejoratively like foreigners or immigrants or whatever, the alien. He's saying, who do people outside of us 12 here say that I am. And some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say you are one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. And the reason why this is so important that people are saying this is because Jesus, for nine chapters in the book of Luke, he has been saying over and over again, I am not any of these guys. I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. And the reason he does what he does, performing all these miracles, is not because he's a recapitulation or not just a recapitulation, but he's not just a resurrection of one, of these, one of these people. It's because he is God. And yet, what do people think of him? Do they admit and confess that he is God? No, they, they refuse to believe it. They know that Jesus is important, or maybe one way to put it is this. They refuse to listen to his words carefully. They simply assumed what they saw visually and what they heard verbally. Jesus is saying literally to them and to the crowd, I am the son of God. If you come to me, I forgive sins, which is something only the Old Testament God did and does. 
and yet they refuse to hear directly from Jesus, and instead they only wanted to buy into what other people said about him. Logically speaking, I don't know how many of you feel like a lot of your theology is based on that right there. Where if I ask you a question about Jesus, you, you, you could say something, and if I ask you, where did that something come from? How many of us would say, honestly, it's what I heard at church one day or something I read on the internet or something I saw on TikTok or something versus, oh, it's in John chapter four, verse 12. Oh, it's in Ephesians three, nine, right? Instead of that, instead of going directly to Jesus, there's this assertion and assumption that we make of Jesus. That's the first thing that that verse, that notion of what people say about Jesus is suggesting. And number two, it's saying that people were willing to respect Jesus but they didn't want to repent to Jesus. People were willing to say, Jesus has got some good stuff to say, but he is not the author of salvation. I could give him my ears, but I am not going to give him my soul. I don't know. Is that anybody? Does that remind you of anybody? Afterwards, Jesus says, warned his disciples not to tell anyone he was, who he was after Peter gets it right and says, you're the Messiah which we'll talk about in a moment, but we know what Peter said was right, and we can assume it's not just Peter who said it, but everyone else. We know what they say is right because his response, Jesus's response to what they said was pretty deep. It was pretty visceral. He says, make sure you don't tell anybody that because if you do, every single person you tell is probably going to want to kill me because they think I'm crazy. They'll think that you're crazy, and they'll want to kill all of us, and eventually they do as we'll see in a moment. And he goes on and says, not only is it dangerous for you to tell this truth to others, but it's in, even more so because I know in specific the dangers that will eventually come about because you do tell people about it. Or in other words, what do they say about Jesus? What, what is the they in this story? Who do they say Jesus is? Again, they say he's someone to listen to, but he's not someone to live for and give your life for. And as a result, I don't know. It sounds like not much has changed since first century Galilee and 21st century Bellevue or Renton. Because in the same way, I think if the data is right, the data says that your generation sees Jesus no differently. There are some, in fact, that actually see Jesus the same that those Pharisees that crucified Jesus saw him as so anti-system, or the word we use nowadays is bigot, racist, sexist, so anti-system that we need to destroy him. That's your generation right here. I think this is crazy, okay? 40% of Gen Z believe, 40% of your demographic believe that Jesus sinned. That's kind of nuts. 76% of your generation, okay with lying right? Your generation also has the most what we call nons and atheists than ever before in history. Non is not even atheist. A non is someone who I don't even identify as atheist. I am nothing, which is crazy. That's crazy. What do you believe in? Nothing. What happens when you die? Nothing. Your generation has the highest number of nons. In other words, what do they say about Jesus? What do they say? I think they, whoever they are, outside of Bible-believing Christ followers, what they're saying has not changed since the first century, since the dawn of time, since Genesis chapter 6 and Noah's age. People have been saying the same thing. I'll give God my ears, but I won't give God my soul. What about us then? What about the church? What do we say about Jesus? And that's kind of what was happening here. Peter, on behalf of all the disciples, he says, you're the Messiah of God. And again, Jesus, he proves that they, what he is saying and what they are saying is right. But what's interesting is this. The way he says that you are right, Peter and disciples, that I am the Messiah, is he tells them all the things that are going to happen to them and all the crazy things that will happen because they are right. He's saying, because I am the Messiah, I'll have to suffer terrible things. And if you associate with the Messiah, guess what? You're probably going to have to suffer some terrible things. I'm going to be betrayed by your leaders. 
right? Your presidents, your governors, your politicians, your superintendents, your principals, your teachers in the classroom, your university professors, everybody is going to hate me. And maybe because you associate with me, they will probably hate you too. What a way to convince a bunch of people to follow you, right? And if I can sum up what he says to them, it's four things. He says, if I am your Messiah, if you say that I am your Messiah, if you say, I don't believe what they say about Jesus, I believe what Peter just said and the disciples said, I believe Jesus is my, my Messiah. What you're essentially saying is, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, so much so and such that I'm okay with being rejected even by people that I really want to be respected by. I'm okay with daily, every single day, daily picking up my cross. And so there's a permanence to it. And also not just picking up a calling, but picking up a cross, which is suffering. And I'm willing to follow specifically what Jesus says and where Jesus leads me. That's what it means to suggest that Jesus is not what they say he is, just a good, respectable figure, someone that maybe you can take some wisdom from, but certainly not give your life onto. To say what is counter to that and to say that Jesus is the Messiah is painful. It's, it's costly. It's pricely. And later on, the disciples would pay that price. Every single one of the disciples, minus John, was martyred. And oftentimes in horrible, horrific ways, Peter and Paul martyred in Rome, Andrew crucified in, Soviet, in what is now today Soviet Union, Thomas pierced by a bunch of spears in India because he refused their deities, Philip crucified in Asia Minor, James stoned and clumped to death as he was sharing the gospel, Simon also martyred for refusing to submit to the sun god, Matthias burned to death in Syria. John was then exiled to Patmos, and since their death and martyrdom, their sacrifice, their painful, pricely, costly confession of Jesus as the Messiah, since then, millions upon millions of Christians have followed in suit. In fact, this data I thought was very fascinating. From 20, 2001 to 2010, about a million Christians were martyred. In the last 10 years or so, 900,000 approximately, and we don't know because many of these people are martyred in villages out there that can't report their martyrdom. Who does they, who do they say Jesus is? Could be someone, but he's not the ultimate one, the saving one. Who do you, we say, who does the church say he is? He's, we say that he's the Messiah, and therefore... We're willing to enter into a pricey, costly confession that may cost us not just some things, but everything. Now, here's the DTR, my friends. What about you? What about you? You get what they're saying. You get what the church is supposed to say. Now, what about you? What do you say? I think it's for this reason Jesus continues, and he says this, and I just want you to Hear this as if Jesus is saying this to you personally. If you try to hang onto your life, you will lose it. If you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he enters in, enters in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I tell you the truth. Some of you standing here talking about the disciples right now will not die before they see the kingdom of heaven. And in the next story, they do. But what about you? What about you? Who is Jesus to you? See, just spending some time being a little bit metaphysical here, C.S. Lewis famously said, there are only two kinds of people at the end of the day. Those who say, God's will be done, or rather say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there can be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find it. Those who knock it, knock it. Those who knock, it is opened. My friends, for me, when I think about Christ and how 
costly it is to call him my Messiah, I, I know how painful it is. Man, when I first came to Christ in the eighth grade, I lost my best friends. Those homeboys I told you about, the one kicker for them was that I became a Christian. And that was the one reason they, they no longer were there for me. Because they suddenly felt judged. They suddenly felt like, and every time I would bring up the gospel, would you, hey, do you guys want to come to church with me? You want to, hey, let's talk about God. They, they always hated that viscerally for some reason. And I was young, so I didn't really know much at that time either. But I lost friends over that. When I think about the cross and I think about Jesus and I think about who Jesus is to me, when I say that Jesus is my Messiah, I think I know it's painful. And I know it's hard. But I also know it's really, really good. I think some of you in this room need to have a DTR with Jesus. Some of you have, your Jesus is what they said about Jesus. And so this, today is your wake up call. No, no, no. Jesus is the Messiah. He is God himself. Meaning if he is truly God himself, then all those lies that have been given to you by them, uh, they, they need to, they are now put to death. And the truths of Christ now come to life. And that is painful. I think some of you need to have a DTR with Jesus, even right now. As you're thinking about who is Jesus to me? And some of you have been refraining from doing that because you know that it's costly. You know that it's painful. You know that you have to sacrifice something. Some of you have not been having a DTR with Jesus because you know the moment you do, you have to stop doing something. You have to stop practicing something, watching something, saying something. For some of us out there, it means you stop dating someone. Some of us, we avoid DTR because we know that just like Jesus said it would, it would cost us something. But I'm telling you, or rather I am telling you, and I am telling you, I know. I know. For me, it cost me everything as well. It is painful. It is hard to say Jesus is my Messiah. I know. But I'm also telling you, it is good. It is good. Let me just close on this. One of my favorite verses when I was um, in high school was Philippians 4.13, which comes right after this, right? I think I told some of you this story. When I graduated high school, as some of you know and have seen, it was at like a stadium, and then you go up, you get your degree, and you walk back to your seat, right? And then when you walk back to your seat on the aisles, there are your teachers sort of sitting there. And as I was walking back to my seat, there was one teacher I really, really liked. He was really hard, but he was a, a good teacher, Mr. Blair. He taught AP British literature. And uh, I knew that he was kind of a Christian based on some of the things he said. And he was also like the faculty advisor for the Bible club and things like that. So I had a suspicion. And so I was walking back to my seat and, you know, he lifts out his hand to shake my hand and I shake his hand and he grabs me, pulls me in. And in my ear, he whispers, Philippians 4.13. And I was like, what? And he's like, Philippians 4.13. That's all he said. That nothing else. He didn't even say congratulations. Not even my name. He just said Philippians 4.13. I'm like, wait, what? So I go home. I look that verse up. And that verse says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm like, wow. Yes, Mr. Blair. Prosperity, pleasure, comfort. I love it. But I know Mr. Blair because, again, he's the AP British lit teacher. So he's not just going to drop a quote and be like, that's the, that's it. There's no context. In fact, the whole purpose of his class is to read context. And so I read the entire chapter and right before 413, Paul says, I once thought all these things that brought me pleasure and joy, I thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all, not most, but all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him 
I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. And I know that's hard. And that's why he continues and says, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know calling Jesus the Messiah is hard. It's costly and it's painful. But I think the, the thing that I want to introduce some of you for the first time into is the, the notion and the reality that something painful can also be really, really good. You could have a relationship that's very painful, but really, really good. You could experience something like work that costs a lot, but it could also be really, really good. There can be relationships that are costly, but are ultimately good. And that's it. That's, so my invitation for you, my application, that's it. I don't want to tell you anything else. My invitation is this. Who is Jesus to you? Maybe some questions to help us, and then we'll break out into small groups. Um, is the goodness of Jesus limited by what they say? When you hear me say following Jesus and being a Christian is hard. I know it. it's costly. It requires sacrifice of things you'd like to do. I get that. But is the pain of that because you've purchased too much of what they have to say of Jesus instead of going directly to the words of Jesus himself? Second question, what are hard questions you need to start answering? Because, you know, DTRs, they require questions like, what are we? Uh, how how do you feel about me? How do I feel about you? Do you like me? Do I like you? There are hard questions you need to ask when it comes to defining the relationship between you and Jesus. And maybe some of you have been avoiding them. This morning, I want you to start asking them. What are difficult sacrifices you need to start making? Because Jesus is your Messiah. And lastly, how does Jesus make hard and difficult things easier? Let me pray for us, okay? Jesus, I, I'm not sure um, exactly why you brought this text into my soul this week. Um, but I know there's, there's a reason, there's purpose behind it. Lord, I trust that because this is your word and what we have done this morning is study your word, there's at least one person in this room who needed to hear something said here in your word this morning. And Lord, or rather I should, I should say, but Lord, let us not be fearful. Let us not be cowardice, Lord. Let us not be addicted to our comfort such that anything that is costly, we want to avoid and shield ourselves from. But even though it is difficult to think about Jesus as my Messiah, the Savior of my soul, not just the illuminator of my mind or the giver of emotions, but the Savior of my soul, knowing that that is costly in many, many ways, may I also look upon the price and cost that you paid on that cross for me. So that even though I, I will be called to some suffering, a carrying of a cross in this life, even though there is a cross I must bear, a sacrifice I must make, and sacrifices I need to continue to make to claim you as my Messiah, may I be reminded, may we be reminded this morning that there is an ultimate cross we could never carry that you carried alone, the weight of which we could never survive under. And yet you died under. And so as we think about the cross of Jesus, convict us with the question, number one, who do they say Jesus is? How good do they say Jesus is? How worth it do they say Jesus is? And Lord, ask us individually, personally, who do I say Jesus is? How good do I say Jesus is? I may not understand everything perfectly, but who, who do I say Jesus is for me today? As we enter into small groups, would you lead us into these questions? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, 
sisters, you can stay here. How about young, uh, younger men? Will you follow Minister Josh to the office? And then older men, let us go to the game room over here. <laughs>